I don't want to be flip in this answer. We don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about it because we have a core belief. And that core belief is that in times of crisis, the correlation of everything to everything else is 1.0. You know, there is, there is no diversification. It is all going one way or the other at any given point in time. So what do you do to make sure that you don't get flushed when you're in a circumstance such as that? Well, again, not being too levered, having the core uh, portfolio of the, of the fixed income securities, which is the, you know, the fundamental building block of the company. Um, and basically, you know, our insurance liabilities, because of the mix of business, not, there's, there's not a fire and a disaster every day. Uh, they, they happen episodically and they happen over a period of time. So on average, when, when we have a premium come in, it's gonna stick around for four or five years before it goes out. So when we have a dollar come in on premium, basically we would buy a four or five year fixed income um, bond. Uh, and generally speaking, even with interest rates moving around, uh, a four, five, six year bond, that's not gonna move in price that much. So it, it, it stays pretty tight. And we have enough capital and enough substance that we can afford to ride out the volatility of, of the other bits. Now on accounting uh, aspects, the publicly traded securities are marked to market, so you see that volatility there every day. Uh, on the businesses that we own, we don't mark those to market because they're, you know, they're, they're arm's length French taxes which they're purchased. And then it's old fashioned equity accounting of, of sorts where the money they make just becomes part of the retained earnings, becomes part of the capital base, and that's how the value gets there over time. And that's not subject to mark to market. So that, that builds durability and, 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 and structure. But it's, a, it's basically, you know, if you were um, going to go ice skating and you looked at a pond and it had been below freezing for two days and you saw a sheet of ice in that pond, your mom should know enough to say, it's only been below freezing for two days, that ice isn't thick enough. After it's two weeks, okay, you know. We, so we don't go on the ice unless it's been frozen for two weeks instead of two days is the, is the general way we would think about that. Well, you know, as the baby boom generation ages, you hear this new thing. You hear that uh, 60 is the new, or 40 is the, 60 is the new 40, because um, we're all getting older, so we like to lie to ourselves that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, in financial markets, I would say uh, 10 is the new 20. So if you look at a, an investor uh, who's compounding capital and equity like markets in this kind of environment, if they're compounding at something north of 10 in a double digit uh, rate for a meaningful period of time, they are really good at what they do. Really, really good. And you know, there's some of us who would have residual memories of somebody compounding at 18, 20, 22 percent or whatnot. I don't think that's realistic for large sums of money these days. And I think if you try that, you're taking so much risk and you're doing stuff that's so edgy that you risk uh, a wipeout. So I would much rather see somebody who's able to do things at 10 and, and, and do that on a, on a steady basis. So first answer to your question is, um, I think in general people should lower their return expectations. I think you'll be better served, you'll be happier and more likely to achieve a pretty darn good result if you have lower expectations in the environment that we're in right now. There's, there's a whole lot of stuff going on. There's, you know, a whole lot of <laughs> aspects to this, but to, to, to drill it down. So we live in this zero interest percent world and this zero interest percent regime. Um, and we have negative interest rates in many markets around the world. And I'm not talking weird, bizarre East Elbonia markets. I'm talking Germany, uh, major developed markets. And we're flirting with them here in the U.S. And, um, so I've been doing a lot of work on this, and I, I had a chance to talk to probably the smartest person. If you could name the person that you would want to talk to to ask about this, I got to talk to that person and have dinner with them. And spend. I said, you know, I try to be a really good student and learn from history, learn from other people's mistakes as well as my own. So, I mean, what book should I read? What what should I study? What should I do to try to learn how to operate in a world of zero or negative interest rate? And he laughed. He says, there isn't a history of negative interest rates. It doesn't exist. I said, you know, if, uh, 
if, if interest rates were zero and that was a historically normal thing, I don't think Jesus would have been so pissed at the money changers in the temple. <laughs> so, <clears throat> they were charging something more than zero. Zero is, a wrong, is an incorrect rate. It's wrong. But the world doesn't really care what I think. So it is reality. And, and how should I adjust to it? And why is it the reality? Well, part of the reason it's a reality is with the central banks uh, in charge as much as they are, you know, they've just created this regime of, of 0% interest rates. And I, th I think things have happened that they did not expect as a result of this. And in point of fact, um, just supply and demand. So, so at first, I would have said five years ago, when interest rates were very low and had lower, I would have thought they would have gone back up. And I thought the central banks were, were pressing down on interest rates to manipulate that and make that happen. If you ask me today, and I, I challenge people as a thought exercise, you know, if, if the Federal Reserve did not exist, if the European Central Bank did not exist, if there were no central banks, what would interest rates be? I don't think they'd be much higher than they are right now. No, it's this is because in terms of supply and demand, to your point, there's more capital than there is demand. And part of that is the worldwide GDP is not growing very much. It's very suppressed return. So that's reality. Um, but if you can do things that solve people's problems, that have new ideas, that somehow or another can eke out a positive return, and you can, you can grind out 8, 10, 12 percent, I think you're a superstar, an absolute superstar. So I think to recalibrate expectations of what, uh, you know, what is an appropriate rate of return um, and not make the error. So one of the things, um, yeah, very low interest rates are not unprecedented. And um, remember long-term capital management, which blew up Solomon Brothers you know, in, the, in the late 90s? Well, why did that happen? You had all these Nobel laureates, these Nobel Prize winners who were uh, involved. Well, all it was was this huge super leveraged bet where interest rates were, were down a bunch and there was a, a positively sloped yield curve. So they borrowed a ton, a ton of money at the short end and they invested it at the long end. And they thought they could dynamically hedge and synthetically keep positioning themselves to make sure that even if things moved, they could always earn that, arb, that, that, that carry. And they couldn't. I don't care how many Nobel Prize winners you have. I don't care if Watson, the IBM supercomputer, is, is at it. It'll, it'll work every single day beautifully until the day it utterly collapses. So that, that movie's been played a thousand times before. It's being played right now. So the other thing I would add is just make sure that you don't get caught up in uber-leveraged arbitrage schemes because they will, they will look good every single day until the day it becomes an epic disaster. I'm going to answer it just for us yeah. because of the skills that we would have. We are vanilla, vanilla, vanilla. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's governments and high-end munis. And fortunately, we got our board meeting coming up. And I have like a six-page memo that I lay out the, the investment, you know, what's going on, what we did, what we bought, what we sold, why we did that, why we did. And, and the fixed income component of that six-page report is two paragraphs. And I say, we have the high-quality fixed income portfolio that's matched on our currency and our duration. And the, the only way I have a second paragraph to write is to tell you that we, the only thing we own in Puerto Rico or Brazil, which you would uh, you know, hear about in fixed income, are what we are legally required to have to post because we do business in those jurisdictions, so you're, you're forced to buy some. You just price that into the cost of doing business that you're going to lose money on that investments. And we don't have any Atlantic City, and we don't have any Detroit. And so I struggle to come up with something to say uh, because we are so vanilla in what we do. That's not a generic statement for everybody else. Some people are very, very skilled at uh, high rate lending, you know, and that there's a whole spectrum. But that's a specialized skill. And, and so if somebody's good at that, great. That's just not what we know how to do. Well, in, this, in the same way that, uh, you know, if you, were, if you were coaching VCU basketball and you, you, know, you hear the, the stories of how the coach works, you study the film of the teams you're going to play. <laughs> Absolutely. And you, you, 
you steal shamelessly when you see people, <laughs> wow, that was a really good play, and I wonder if we could do that. So, so we, would, we would study, and everything that one could do publicly, we, we would do. Um, we attend the annual meeting, we listen, we, we read everything, um, and there's, there's nothing non-public. But the things are, are pretty explicit. As are we. It's a regulated business. It's fairly transparent. Uh, you can see what other people are charging for risks. What you, what you're doing. You you study the films in the same way that any thoughtful, diligent coach would would look at the films of a successful player. And frankly, there's a barbell approach in that you study the films of somebody like Berkshire. You say, what are they doing that we should be doing too? You also study the films of the people that are screwing it up. And what do, we, what do we need to do to make sure we don't do that uh, is an equally important, important part of the job. I tell people, you know, there's, there's two kinds of folks who can opine on uh, a broad question such as that. There's those who don't know and those who don't know they don't know. <laughs> <clears throat> and I'm in the first category. I mean, I really don't know. Um, and I would say to you that... Um, I pride myself on being a pretty good student of history. I've read a lot of history. I like history. I study it all the time. And so many things that you see happen uh, are things that happened before. So it really is important to, to study historical stuff. I would also tell you, and there's a, there's a joke that, that says the four most expensive words in investment are this time it's different. <laughs> Because it, what, it was John Templeton who said that. It was a legendary great investor, and he was trying to make the point that it's not different. It's, it's going to be the same. Now, at the risk of offending the ever-honored memory of a luminary like John Templeton, there are things about this cycle which are different. Um, and there are not good historical guideposts to make uh, all of the decisions that y you need to make. So some of those things, they're just beyond your control. There's nothing you can do about it. So what things are within your control, what things should be reasonable, logical, from a bottom-up micro sense, and do that. And then just, uh, just make sure you're, you're, you're there to an answer the bell for the next round. But, but I, I really can't answer your question. Uh, the one last statement I will make about that to try to I'm a pretty optimistic person, and this, this might not come across as optimistic as I mean it to be, but let me couch it that way. So for years and years, every time somebody would complain about politics or you know, the leadership or who the president was or whatnot, I would make this offhand remark, and I would say, hey, you know, we got through Millard Fillmore, so we'll get through fill in the blank. So about three months ago, I made that statement, and the guy said, what do you know about Millard Fillmore, really? And I said, really very little. <laughs> and he said, okay, well, I want you to read this book. Um, and then, you know, then talk to me about it. So he gave me this book, and I read it, and it was fascinating. And, you know, uh, Fillmore became president in 1850. He was vice president. He was sort of reluctant to become the vice president, but just kind of got sucked into this, this thing. And, and he was a, sort of just a leading community citizen sort of fellow, always... Uh, chamber of Commerce kind of guy building up Buffalo at a time of great uh, growth in the Erie Canal and all this. So he gets sort of sucked up into this thing. And uh, uh, Taylor was the president. Sorry, my memory slipped. And Taylor died while in office, so Fillmore became the president. And this is uh, 1850. So the tensions for the Civil War are starting to build, and Fillmore's just trying to can't we all get along kind of guy and making deals and compromise and people were not in the mood to compromise so it just got sort of worse and worse and then when it came time for him to you know think about whether he was going to run for re-election he was not really wild about that so the just the time and circumstances blew right through him so he didn't get the nomination didn't run so from 1852 to 1856 he went back to Buffalo and again a very honorable person there were no presidential pensions at the time um, he really had some money, but not enough to just live in the way that he'd been used to living. And he was very reluctant to trade on his position as being an ex-president of the United States. Very honorable guy, you know, he was a, he was a lawyer, but he didn't want to practice law because he had been the president and he just thought, this is, there's, there's just something that feels off about this. So he kind of struggled. 
Well, then in 1856, there was the formation of what was known as the American Party, which also known as the Know Nothing Party. And their positions on trade and immigration and whatnot, you would think you're reading about today. You know, and they got 80 seats in Congress, and, and he got sort of drafted to be the presidential candidate of that party just because he was a celebrity, even though that really didn't fit his style of doing things. But, you know, we, we, we got through it. Now, it was a civil war, so I don't mean to be too pessimistic and think about the resolution mechanisms that we got through what seemed like intractable, intractable differences. But any study of history would tell you that there have often been periods of time when people were very opposed and just just very tense and we're in one of those periods and the overlay of that right now is sort of this uh, the whole technological shift in artificial intelligence and that sort of stuff which is moving very very fast and we don't have a whole lot of precedent for how to um, react and, and adapt to that but we will and just got to just got to be able to answer the bill for the next round of the fight. Well, the positive sense is, you know, little old Markel um, and the company started, you know, in, 19, in the 1930s in Norfolk, Virginia. It was a very local business. Um, and Sam Markel was the founder. And, you know, up until 1986 when they went public and even through 90 in the first sort of deal, it was a very local regional business. And, you know, a couple of offices and a couple of people in the span of control that you would have as the owner or operator or manager of the business needed to be pretty tight because you're constrained by physical reality and geography. Little old Markel, like I said, does 40% of our business all around the world uh, these days. That would not be possible without technology and all the things that technology enables you to do. It gives you more information and more data. It also gives your competitors more access to, to data. So it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an arms race. Uh, and there's good things about that and challenges about it, but it is the reality of the world, the option of sort of staying uh, where you were and not changing and not ad adapting is a road to death. So we have no interest in that. Uh, it's like Charlie Munger's joke. He said all he wants to know is where he's going to die, and then he'll never go there. Uh, <laughs> and to, to, to make the decision that you um, don't want to adapt or change or... or or race ahead, that's a fatal decision. So we won't make that decision. All right. Well, again, thanks so much for your time and uh, attention. Uh, I wish you well because I know you represent the business community of Richmond, and it's a win-win it's a deal for all of us to, uh, to make this place a, a better place. Thank you.